Professionalism is the term used to reflect the standards expected of you as a health support worker. It also requires you to be law-abiding and of good character and to carry out your duties properly. Two support workers were sacked after they failed to carry out checks on a patient who absconded from a recovery unit and was later found dead on a beach. His absence had gone unnoticed for more than three hours due to the failings of the support workers. He should have been checked on the hour every hour, but on the day of his disappearance he was recorded three times as having been present when in fact he had left. Staff made assumptions that they had seen the man and he was incorrectly recorded as being present. Professionalism represents the values, skills and behaviour that underpin your role as a support worker. It requires strict adherence to guidance for behaviour and performance. It requires you to act honestly and with integrity. And in return, it protects patients and preserves public confidence in the health service and its staff. Professionalism is underpinned by accountability. Lewis and Beatty defined accountability as the fulfilment of a formal obligation to disclose to reverend others the purpose, principles, procedures, relationship results, income and expenditure for which one has authority. If we look at that definition a little more closely, we see that the fulfilment of, an, of a formal obligation means that professionalism and accountability has its basis in law. A formal or legal relationship exists between you, the practitioner, and the reverent others or the higher authorities that are entitled to call you to account. We see that the extent of the scrutiny is very wide. It covers not just your conduct, but the purpose, principles, procedures, relationship results, income and expenditure, for which you have authority. So to be accountable is to be answerable for your acts and omissions. The expectation of professionalism is that you are answerable, answerable for your personal acts or omissions to a higher authority with whom you have a legal relationship. Professionalism therefore has four functions a protective function, that is, it protects the public from the acts or omissions that might cause them harm. It has a deterrent function. The threat of sanction is seen as a deterrent and prevents you from acting outside your scope of practice or in an unprofessional manner. It has a regulatory function. The law regulates your behaviour and it allows action to be taken to protect the public if you breach the regulations. And it has an educative function. If you're found liable, you will have a public hearing with the reassurance to society that other practitioners will learn from these cases and refrain from acting in a similar manner. By tradition, we say that professionalism draws together three areas of law to try and provide maximum protection for patients. The criminal law or the public law can punish you if you commit a crime either in work or outside of work. Your duty of care to your patient means that you mustn't be careless and you mustn't harm your patient through your carelessness. And the employer's standards bind you through the contract of employment and allows the employer to take action against you, disciplinary measures against you, if you breach their standards. These duties are not mutually exclusive. If your conduct is poor enough, all three of these can apply to you. An NHS support worker who secretly drove a taxi while on paid sick leave was caught out when his manager spotted him at the wheel in a taxi rank. He received an immediate 16 week custodial sentence from the court. He was suspended for one year from his job. He had to do 
160 hours unpaid community work and he was also ordered to pay £11,000 compensation to the National Health Service. Another support worker who called a woman in her care a stupid cow in a bust up over who should be doing the washing up was ordered by a court to pay £100 in compensation to the victim and £100 in court costs. The court ordered her to also attend a 20 day rehabilitation course and she was sacked from her job. This photograph illustrates a support worker who was suspended after she apparently had a cigarette break while shopping bags were dumped on a man with learning disabilities she was supposed to be looking after. Following an inquiry, she did keep her job, but was issued with a final written warning. So three areas of law are drawn together to protect the patient and can individually or collectively hold you to account. It is often asked whether health support workers can be accountable to themselves for their acts or omissions. Whilst there's no question that a health support worker who harms a patient through their act or omission will feel remorse, this can't be guaranteed and it can't be regarded as truly holding themselves to account. You can't have a legal relationship with yourself. Society holds you to account through the public law. Many of these laws are derived from Acts of Parliament, such as the Road Traffic Act, the Theft Act, or the Offences Against the Person Act of 1861. These acts are known as Public General Acts, and it's entirely possible to breach them in the course of your practice. Breaching a provision of a Public General Act usually attracts a criminal charge. In Hunter and Mann, a doctor who refused to disclose to the police information that would have led to the identity of a driver of a stolen car on the grounds of confidentiality was convicted of an offence under the Road Traffic Act that placed a duty on a person to give information which may lead to the identification of the driver of a vehicle. In the Crown Against Hinks, a support worker was convicted of theft under Section 1 of the Theft Act 1968 when a jury decided that accepting gifts of money from a vulnerable patient with limited intelligence that she was caring for was a dishonest thing to do. The Salisbury case is a case of a ward sister who was jailed for five years when she was convicted of attempted murder of two of her patients when a jury accepted evidence that she'd administered overdoses of diamorphine to hasten their deaths. The Salisbury case is a good example of a prosecution arising from practice. Health professionals are generally free from prosecution when touching patients during the course of their treatment, which can often be intimate in nature. This is because the courts say that bodily invasion in the course of proper medical treatment stand completely outside the criminal law. Health professionals will not be held accountable if their care can be said to be proper treatment as it falls outside the scope of the criminal law. In the Crown against Gauche, a doctor was charged with two counts of indecent assault on a female patient. The doctor had handled her breasts on one occasion and on a later occasion handled her breasts, inserted a finger into her anus and her vagina when examining her for a finger injury. In another case, a care home manager with 10 years experience was sentenced to three months imprisonment when she attempted a manual evacuation of faeces on a resident in her care even though she had not been trained to do the procedure and left the patient very distressed and in a lot of pain. Health support workers are accountable to their patients as well as to society. They're accountable for the individual care that they provide. The tort or civil law system allows a patient to sue for compensation if they believe that harm has been caused to them through carelessness. 
Current estimates place the total NHS compensation bill in England and Wales at above £1.4 billion. Pounds. The standard of care expected of you as a support worker is set out in your duty of care. You're not generally required to owe a duty to be careful to just anyone. There is no duty of simple rescue, for example, in England and Wales. Uh, in certain situations, called duty situations, it is the nature of the relationship that gives rise to a duty of care. Generally, the courts rely on previous cases to guide them as to when a duty of care arises. And there are many cases that highlight that a support worker looking after a patient owes that patient a duty of care, a duty to be careful or a duty to take care. You will breach that duty of care where the professional standard is broken. The professional standard is determined by reference to a case called Bolam and Frian Hospital Management Committee. The Bolam test, as it's known, requires that skilled professionals such as health support workers meet the standard of the ordinary skilled person exercising and professing to have that special skill. The standard covers the whole of your relationship with the patient. It includes direct care. It includes the quality of the advice you give. It includes the quality of your record keeping and even the standard of your handwriting. If your actions are in keeping with a respected body of opinion, then you will not have fallen below the standard required of you in law and there will be no liability in negligence. This will be the case even if there were different ways of performing the same task. Courts cannot find negligence because of a preference for one professional's view over another. However, any expert evidence that is used to support your actions must stand up to what the courts call logical analysis. The existence of a common practice in a profession doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't negligent. Even if accepted practice is followed, it doesn't preclude a finding of negligence. In a case called Reynolds and North Tyneside Health Authority, the court reminded you that you will not be exonerated because others too are negligent or common professional practice is slack. The law makes no allowance for beginners. It is no defense to say that actions were in accordance with someone who had just started their post. You must also realize the limits of your capabilities. A failure to refer the matter for a more senior opinion will fall below an acceptable standard of care and you will be held accountable. You are expected to keep your knowledge up to date throughout your career. Although the law accepts that a period of time must be allowed for the information to come to the attention of the profession. The final hurdle to be overcome by a patient trying to prove negligence is that of causation. This is based on the but for test. But for your carelessness, would the patient have suffered harm? Negligence is usually thought of as a civil matter where a patient is paid compensation. But it is possible where a patient dies as a result of carelessness for the support worker to face a charge of gross negligence manslaughter. Because support workers owe their patients a duty of care, failing in that duty that leads to death can result in a criminal prosecution for gross negligence manslaughter. In one case, in the Isle of Man, a woman was over sedated by ward staff. She had to take to her bed. When in bed, the staff did not ensure her skin integrity and she developed pressure sores the size of a fist, which became infected causing septicemia. That resulted in her death. 
The staff on the ward, the ward manager and one other were jailed for a one year each because of gross negligence manslaughter. Negligence is a fault based system. The person at fault is expected to pay the compensation. But the concept of vicarious liability says that it is the employer who is legally accountable if the civil wrong, the tort, is committed during the course of employment. This concept dates back to a time when the law held a master to be responsible for the actions of their servant. A health support worker who is employed by the National Health Service or other organisation is accountable to their employer through the contract of employment. The contract sets out the terms and conditions of employment and the standard of work expected of you as an employee. Many of these terms are written in the contract, such as your salary, holiday entitlement, hours of work, and are known as express contract terms. Other terms are not expressly written, but they're there by virtue of decided cases or employment related legislation. These are known as implied contract terms and include a warranty from you as the employee to your employer that we will carry out your duties with due care and diligence. For the health support worker, their employer is the most likely authority to hold them to account. Firstly, this is because a patient with a grievance against a support worker is more likely to complain to the employing trust or health board than take legal action. Secondly, employment law allows a lower burden of proof when deciding whether an employee is guilty of misconduct. The employer is not required to prove anything. They simply need to hold an honest and genuine belief that you probably committed misconduct as a result of a reasonable investigation. As well as being accountable to your employer through reasonable disciplinary measures, support workers also owe a contractual duty of care to their employers. A breach of that duty allows an action for damages for breach of contract. The standards imposed on you by your employer arise from the Health Inspectorate Wales. They inspect health services across Wales and they check that their standards are being met. Inspections take place regularly and are often unannounced. And during the inspections, they will speak to service users, they will speak to you as members of staff, and they will check that the right systems and processes are in place. They also continually monitor information from inspections, from members of the public, from healthcare staff, health services and other organisations. So health support workers are accountable, they are expected to act professionally and they have to ensure that they discharge their duties to their patient under the criminal law, under their employment standards and to discharge their duty of care and to take care not to harm patients they are looking after.